Welcome to another episode of Dad Up, everyone. Thank you guys very much for joining me today. I'm super excited for my guest. He's not only been a friend of mine and, and we've coached together over the years, um, but now he's kind of got a whole new role that I want him to kind of share. But I'm really excited to have Coach Rob Robinson on Dad Up. Welcome to the show, brother. Oh, man, I, I, pleasure to be here. It was great catching up with you again and seeing where you guys are at with your program and where you've been coaching uh, had all those years coaching against each other in various leagues and different schools. And it was it was really good to be able to catch it back up with you again under these circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's been a, been a while since we've seen each other. For those of you that are listening or watching, you know, Coach Rob and I, uh, including the school that I currently coach at, uh, we have uh, coached against each other um, several times in games and he's always kicked our butts <laughs> but he's a good dude and um, I'm really excited to for you guys to hear uh, the stuff that he's doing now because he's been a part of this program that's uh, really bringing up young men into a, into a great atmosphere of uh, sports and not only that but he's you know he's part of the Netflix series um, Last Chance You so he's had a chance to uh be on, be on television and have that experience as well. But I'm really excited for him to share his experience. So Rob, for my listeners who may not know who yeah. you are, give me a little bit of backstory about you and then also how, you know, where you've come from and where you are today and the things you're doing today. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a, uh, yeah, we, if you ever like, if you looked up basketball coach and encyclopedia, you're probably, that's, you're probably going to find, either me or someone very similar. I'm, I'm just all hoops, man. I, I just am. I, um, uh, I'm from Kansas city. I moved out to California in 1989. Uh, my dad moved back to Kansas back in 2000 and I've pretty much been the only Robinson on the West coast forever. Um, so I'm, I'm a Midwestern guy, a Midwestern dude, although I've been in CA for a while. Uh, basketball was a big deal there. Yeah. I, I grew up about 20, 20 miles from KU from Kansas university. Uh, we was all big Jayhawk fans um, and uh, basketball really mattered. And it just kind of sunk, sunk into me. And uh, believe it or not, 1983 was my first basketball season. I was in third grade mm. and uh, I haven't missed a season since I've wow. coached or played every single season since 1983. I've had a next season. Um, I don't even know what, well, I don't even know what life would be like, like with, without it. it, it truly is just, truly is just a part a part of me and like part of my DNA. Um, basketball is an incredible sport. It takes you so many places. Basketball has taken me so many places across the country to meet so many different people in so many different ways. Um, I'm truly grateful like to, to, to be a part of it and, uh, and to be able to coach it. As you just said, uh, this, this coaching journey has been, man, it's, I was, I was a junior college assistant coach in 97. I was, I was a head coach in the United States basketball league. Um, in 1998, 99, um, I got my first high, high, head high school coaching job in 1999. I mean, I was barely, I don't even know if I was 26 yet. I was young. I mean, I, I looked like one of the players. Uh, and, uh, and that started my journey as a 20, I was a high school varsity basketball coach in the Inland Empire for 20 years at Notre Dame High School in, um, in Riverside. Uh, great run, especially there at the end, we were very successful, but we were successful throughout the years. Um, but at the end, we were actually able to get over the hump and win a CIF championship and, 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 and get to the state final. So it was, it was a great run, um, uh, doing high school and it was a great experience, uh, for, for myself. Uh, currently I'm at, um, East LA community college, um, down in LA and that's a different, it's a different hustle. And I've always wanted to be at the college level, but I mean, if anybody listening who is a dad, <laughs> then, you know, once you become a dad, your life is no longer your own. And right. so, um, my, my career path kind of went one way instead of another, because, you know, when, when your wife comes home and says, Hey, we're about to have our first kid. Well, you better find a job with health insurance quick. So, so instead of going to be a, a GA or a volunteer assistant or a restricted earnings coach at the college level, I took a high school job that was full time with benefits, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I thought I'd be a high school coach for 20 minutes, but it actually ended up being 20 years. Uh, but it was it, it was a great run. And um, but now I'm at the college level and that's a it's a completely different level of basketball and dealing with kids in a completely different way. 
but there's no doubt I'm suited for it. And I, at this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm where I belong. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, cool. Let's talk about your kids now. How many kids you have? Oh, my goodness. I got, I have three boys. Um, I have three boys, uh, KJ, uh, Meta and, um, Justice. Two of them are my biological kids and KJ and Justice. They're currently 20, 23 and 20. Um, then my oldest kid, uh, Meta, he's a, he was a foster kid who I literally picked up off the streets when he was 11 years old. I, I hmm. kid you not. He, he went, he came over to spend the night with my kids one night in like fifth or sixth grade. And then I never let him leave. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't going back to that, that foster home ever again. And, um, he has been part of our lives since then. Um, he was a football player, did really well. He played football at Whittier college. He just graduated college in August. Very proud of that young man. Um, so I have three boys, 23, 23 and, and 20, um, uh, they're no longer kids. I I'm now the father of men. And so that's a, uh, that's a different dynamic. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that's for sure. Cause now, now I'm working with them, you right. know, you're no longer like dictating. Now you're working with them and what they need to do or what they want to do. You know, yeah. now it's just, it's operation, make them successful so they can move out. That's the, uh, that's, <laughs> that's what, that's where I'm at today with my, with my kids, but three great kids, man. Three. Great that's, kids. that's awesome. Um, very similar to mine. I mean, I have two boys. Uh, but my boys are 23 and 20 and uh, kind of the same scenario. You know, my my oldest is now graduated from college. My youngest actually plays college basketball at uh, at Hope International University in Fullerton. Oh, cool. Yeah. So so he's playing there. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm like you said, we're, we're kind of once they hit that those adult years, we're no longer like the dictator. Now we're just kind of the the guidance, the guidance counselor. Right. We give them advice. And if they take it, great. If they don't, that's OK, too. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. We're just there to guide them and support them. We're, so we're, we're so hopeful that they take the advice, but you're just looking at them knowing that they're not. And, and then you're like, well, you're just going to have to learn like I did. Right. I'm pretty sure I did the same thing, you know. Uh, so but with, you know, with the COVID thing was interesting because it kind of pushed back kids getting out because it used to be for so many years, you know, you just got to 18 or 19 and they go to college and they leave. And, but it was kind of a weird thing the last couple of years, nobody left. And so um, it's, it's a different dynamic. Uh, but my youngest one, who's, who's 20, um, he was a high school football player as well. It's real weird. Everybody played football in the family and I'm the basketball coach, but I love football. And it truthfully, I would rather have been a football dad than a basketball dad. I'd have been an impossible basketball dad. I mean, there, there would have been no way of making me happy. Right. So I, I'm glad that, I'm glad that I just got to go and be a football fan of my kids. Right. You know, after football games, all I wanted to do was put my hand around them and say, Hey, how was your night? Whether it was good or bad and buy them something to eat or, it, you know, if it was basketball, I'd have been like, what's up with that jump stop? You know, you have to bounce pass in the post. Son. Are you ever going to get in help side? I, that would have been just horrible car rides, you know? So uh, I, uh, I was very grateful for the football experience. And, yeah. And uh, now, now they no longer play. The last one's done. And the other one was actually playing at East LA Community College up until like the first game. And hmm. then he um, he decided he didn't want to he didn't want to play after going through that whole process after playing in high school, which is cool because I when your kids play football, um, you want them to play because they love the sport and it's cool. But I mean, I the day my son's last game in college, and then when my son this last one said he didn't want to play anymore, I celebrated because it is such a dangerous thing that they do and my kids have both had multiple surgeries concussions like the whole thing that comes with football but I know they loved it and I supported it but when my last one came to me Jay he said um he goes dad and he was so sad and he thought I was going to be so disappointed and when he said you know I'm not going to play I was so relieved <laughs> I was so relieved I was like hey son listen you still got your marbles you can walk <laughs> you know what I mean like you know, his brother got dinged up pretty well. You know, my mm. oldest one, his elbows messed up, his knees messed up, multiple concussions. Um, so it's a, uh, I'm, I, I was very pleased with, with that, but it's, uh, it, they're still here. I'm still hoping to push them out, you know, and do the right thing and, and make them responsible adults. You know, they, 
the goal is to get them out so that they don't ever come back. Right. And, and, uh, and I want them to come back every weekend. I want them to come back on Thursdays for dinner or whatever. Of course I want them to come back, but I just, it'd be just cool if they just didn't live here. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I could, uh, so I can maybe downsize, you know, maybe right. get a bedroom apartment in the city. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Just, it just, just, I just have all these rooms and all this stuff everywhere because you have kids everywhere. But that being said, oh my gosh, I, I can't imagine how much I'm going to miss them when that does happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you want them out because I want them to live their own life and have their own experience like they should. That being said, I don't rush it because I know when that, when it's over, it's going to be over. So I've just tried to enjoy like every moment I can, especially the last couple of years, us, us all being around one another. Yeah. That's awesome. I, you know, I consider my boys and you probably feel the same about your three, but now that my boys are adults and they're kind of making the decision, even though they're living here, I consider them two of my best friends, you know, oh, when, yeah. when, when they were growing up and I was their, their dad, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't their best friend. I, they weren't my best friend. I was more of just the, the leader and the role model for them and the guidance and the dictator, as you said earlier, right. But now that they're adults and they make decisions of themselves, I, they're, they're two of my best friends. And I, and I, I love the fact that they're, they're here, but I'm like you dog, I cannot wait for them to be out the house. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, at the house and on their own. So, you know, um, you know what I got? I got that from my father, like my my dad, um, like everybody who's our age, pretty much our dads were either in the military or fought in a war, like almost all like everybody I grew up with. Dad was in Vietnam or Korea or they were in the military at some point, you know, mm -hmm. and so my dad was uh, my dad was in the Vietnam and then he was a police officer before he worked with the feds. Um, he was very strict incredible incredible parent though um but the great my dad used to be on me like for e like everything he was real disciplined and then i moved out and went to college and i remember my life before i left the house and it was like boy be home do this like do that it was like all this stuff right like do this do that but i moved out and i got a scholarship so he didn't have to pay for that and i was making my own decisions and i was only gone like a month and I came home for the weekend and it was a different man. It was a completely different guy. And now he's, now he's, he's the homie, you know? Right. And then, and then I'm like, I, I go to my room to get something and, and I'm going out and I find myself explaining to him, like what I'm going to do for the night. And he goes, I don't care. Like, like what do you mean? I don't have to be home by 1201. Like, what, what are you talking about? You know, it's like, I don't, you, you got it now, son, you know? And it was, and then we became best friends. So from 18 to 49 now, me and my dad have been the best friend. He's my best friend in the world. We've done everything together. We've been there for one another. We have the most incredible conversations and experiences together once I turned 18. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I try to mimic with my, with my own boys. Like, like now, I don't, you know, I don't judge. I don't chastise and preach, man. I just, I just, I just guide them in the right direction. I tell them what's, how I think things should be, what, how, how to live right, what, how to do right. And, um, uh, and I hope they take that advice, like we said, but I'm just their best friend. Now, now I'm, I'm just their biggest cheerleader of all times. I'm my son's biggest cheerleader. And, uh, man, I, it's, it's the greatest feeling having your kids is as good friends. It is, yeah. the best, it is the best feeling. And, and then the weight comes off. You still have the weight because they're your kids, no doubt, but it's a different kind of weight. You know, mm -hmm. you can almost, you can almost breathe. You know, you got past that part where, all right, man, I didn't mess them up. <laughs> you know right. I, I didn't mess them up you know they didn't get in too much trouble i didn't mess them up you know they're working they go to school they got degrees they have solid relationships they're good to their mother and other women you know i'm like okay i didn't mess them up all right so so i feel pretty good about that that's awesome um well let's talk a little bit about the show now sure. last chance you because you know it's you know I, I, for people that have never coached before <laughs> Coaching is one side of it. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a whole animal in itself being a coach to these players. Right. Yeah. But when you got TV cameras and crews around, how did that impact the practices, the oh. games? I mean, I, I'm sure it could have been a distraction. Um, talk a little bit about that. How much of a, a distraction was it? It's a, um, to say it's a distraction is an understatement. It is a, uh, it takes a while to get used to um, right now. They're currently filming season two of it. And so now I am, I am a year and a half into this process. So 
when I get to school, when I get to East LA at like nine, nine thirty in the morning, within an hour, I am mic'd up and, a, and maybe a camera crew following me throughout the day um, or, or, or ready at all times. It's, they'll mic you up and then there'll be a crew outside of wherever you're at. Like if I'm in my office, they're outside. If I'm in the gym, they're right outside the gym. If I'm in the locker room, they're outside the locker room. And what they do is they just literally listen to you all day. And the mm-hmm. moment they want to film something that they're hearing, they just, they, they run in, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. So I've been mic'd up, you know, for years now. And in the beginning, it's the weirdest feeling. Cause when it first started happening, like I didn't know what to say or what to do. And you kind of feel like you're in a show and, and, and you're not your natural self. Right. And that was happening with me as the coach. So you can imagine what an 18, 19, 20 year old kid was feeling when, the mic is on or the camera is there and they're having a conversation with their friend or the coach, or they're even filming practice. Um, It was, it was a huge distraction to start off, but the kids really do get used to it. Um, It affected them for a few weeks and we knew, and we didn't, well, this year we do understand that when it first came, we didn't understand that at all because it was new to, it was new to us. So it was, it was some growing pains with season two. However, right now, like the coaches, we got it. Now it's just helping the kids, you know, get, get through it. Um, last night we lost a buzzer beater um, mm. and we're talented. There's no way we should ever lose, but we did lose by one last night and all of our games are tough because every single game we play, it's the other team's Super Bowl. Every, every one of them, the cameras show up, the crew show up and the other team goes, this is our moment. And the other players say, this is my moment. This is my 15 minutes right here. And every team we play, it plays its best. I mean, every team. And I'm, I'm the number one scout guy on our team. Like, I scout everything. Before we play a team, um, I go over every point they scored the entire year. I look at every set. I look at every player, every point that they scored, which has become increasingly difficult, as you know, as the season goes. It was easy week two because the other team only had 176 points. Right. Now, you know, like when we play Citrus College this Wednesday, you know, I got to look at 735 points scored and, and like how and how they scored it. it. It becomes pretty troublesome, you know, but and you'll look at a team. And so we played a team last week and they're shooting like 30 percent from the three. They make six or seven threes a game. Yeah, they hit 16 threes against us and they're jumping up and down and they're playing the most incredible game. And we win by six. And um, like and I watch them play the next night and the same team loses by 17 and they don't make any threes. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, <laughs> so it's a uh, the cameras change things, but it is um, it is definitely a it's a distraction. And when like if you were in my office right now, Brian, me and you were talking and you can't tell like and we watch it on the show. But in real time, like there's a camera right here and you can't see it. So as me and you are talking right outside the frame here, but within four feet of us is a camera and a mic boom above you and this whole thing. And if you're not used to it, it can it can affect you. It can even get you out of character. But um, you, if you stay true to like who you are as a basketball coach, which is extremely important, you know, and as a father, because I treat these young men just like I would treat my own kids. I don't do anything special. You know, Coach Rob just shows up. The same guy who left the house shows up to the locker room. And I'm going to father them just like I, I father my own kids, especially, you know, it's a different dynamic when they're 16 mm-hmm. and, and they have another parent you have to deal with. But in college, you know, they don't have to do what you say. It's literally just giving them advice and, and trying to, to help them through. And it's a cool dynamic. You know, it's one I think I'm really I'm really suited for. But yeah, that bro, that, that mic and that camera, it'll, it'll change things. It'll make things a little awkward from time to time. Cause I mean, every conversation, my wife calls, you know, now I'm used to it now, but now we just, they hear everything they have, and there's nothing I can do. They don't turn it off, you know, but I, you do learn tricks. Like you take two fingers and go like this, the mic, you can muffle the mic, you know, but Hey, I'm not a, I can't tell you how many times in a week over the last couple of years, like we'll be having a conversation. And I'll be like, hey, guys, don't use this. They'll fire me. I, just, just don't record. I know you had to record it, but just can you put that on the sh- floor right now, the editing floor right now, you know? Hey, everyone. Just want to interrupt this episode real quick 
to let you know that it's sponsored by American Underdog. The upcoming movie featuring Zachary Levi, the star of Shazam and the TV show Chuck, as Kurt Warner, the Hall of Fame quarterback, widely considered the most successful NFL player who was never drafted. You know, Kurt famously rose from stocking shelves during a graveyard shift to ultimately becoming a Super Bowl champion and two-time NFL MVP. And the production team of American Underdogs really done a phenomenal job of bringing that story to life. Now the movie comes out Saturday, December 25th, Christmas Day, and one of its best features is you can enjoy it without knowing a single thing about football. There are a ton of fatherhood themes throughout, along with enough messages of love and perseverance and family that it really could be renamed American Dad Blog. Now the story culminates the Rams' extraordinary championship season of 1999 before Kurt's five youngest kids were even born. And in his interview with Dad 2.0, Kurt mentions what a thrill it was watching it with them to give them an idea what his life was like before they came along. Now, if you want to listen to that interview with Kurt and Zachary, make sure you check out episode 104 of the Dad 2.0 podcast at dad2.com forward slash podcast and check out the trailer of American Underdog at americanunderdog.movie. And you know what? Make it part of your plans this holiday season to go check out the movie with your family. Thank you. And now let's get back to the show. Because in college and dealing with college kids, it gets real, right. <laughs> you know, especially junior college, because at the level we're at and as good as we are. If you're a division one athlete, a legitimate division one athlete, and there's not a lot of those out there, everybody right. says they get full rides and they do this. They don't. It is so hard to play division one basketball. There's only about eighteen hundred scholarships per year in division one basketball. And there's there's literally 10 million people across the world fighting for those eighteen hundred scholarships. It's extremely difficult to do. And at any given time, we have like 10 of them on our team. And if you have that much talent on your team and they're at East LA, then something horribly went wrong with their life. Right. So we're there fixing that constantly. There's, there's something wrong with you. If you're a D one dude and you're in Monterey park at East LA's locker room. Mm. And so it's a, uh, that that's a grind. That's a grind in itself. And then to put that on camera, that's uh, but that's why they're there. Right. That's that's yeah, where the, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where the entertainment is, I guess, you know, but I, I, was, I just felt fortunate with the show that we were able to put a light on JC basketball in a way, not about the basketball, because I mean, it's always about hoops because that's what brings us together and it teaches us those life lessons. But just to put a, a spotlight on these young men, because we're just one community college, you know, of 150 in California, and we're one of a thousand in America. Hmm. And JC is, it's giving kids another shot. It gives them one more chance, you know, and the longer you can keep dudes engaged in college, whether it be whatever reason, is a good thing. It, it is a good thing, especially these guys. There is no telling what these dudes would be doing if right. they wasn't if they wasn't at East LA or these other community colleges. Yeah. You know, I, everybody I tell to, I was like, Hey, help me keep the front doors open because if not, these dudes will be crawling through your back window one night. So right. like, like, help me keep these doors open, support us. And I was hoping that's what the show did like everywhere across the country, like support, support JC dudes, you know, support your community college and understand what these guys are doing. They're trying to save lives. They, People just look at it like this guy's just trying to win basketball games as a coach. You know, it's just about basketball and hoops. And now nah, it's, it's not. It's about shaping young men to be responsible for the rest of their lives, which is which is hard to do because I was right. 20, I was 21 and I was about as irresponsible as you can imagine. I went to school because they told me I had to go to school, you know, because I wanted to play basketball. It takes a while for a guy, a young man to take responsibility for his academics and for his future. Mm -hmm. But what we do with hoops is like we hold them there until they can take responsibility. Like they don't get it. And I got that. I understand. But if we just hold them upright for long enough, at some point they'll be like, okay, I got it, coach. Now I'm going to school for me. You know, right. I'm using basketball as a tool so that I could be better in life. You know, that we just got to hold them upright until that gets there. And I was hoping that's what the show showed is that at the JC level, like we can, we can be positive influence in these kids' lives. And we can really make a difference in a demographic of people across this country that nobody else is that successful at doing it. Mm. Football, basketball, hey, we can do it. Like it works. Right. <laughs> Football and hoops, it works, man. They, 
I always talk about ways to save the community. I'm like, I got the answer, yo. It's it's jump stops, chest passes, and jabs. That's, 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 I got the answer. Just come, hey, come get the blueprint, guys. We can fix it. Just do it in fifth grade, you know. Get kids on a team in fifth grade and start, you know, get them involved in sports, you know, and you intertwine some academics with the sports and get a good role model there, you know. It just just get them there. It just let's let's get that going, you know. It's, yeah. Blueprint is there. Yeah. That's that's cool. I wanted I want to ask you a question, and yeah. this is this is a question that that kind of goes back to last season. Now, uh, I watched last season, and you know, for for those that you haven't seen the episode or that seen the seen the show, you need to watch it. Last Chance You on Netflix. But it is um, last season they had a pretty decent season. They were they were pretty dominant, and then they get to the finals. Now they're about to play the finals and we have this lovely thing called the pandemic that hits and shuts everything down. Now, as a coach, I know these tough conversations you have to have with your players, but I want to know, uh, share with us that conversation because having to tell your players, yeah, you guys were good enough to get to this game and now we can't play. I can imagine it, it hurt you guys as coaches, and I can imagine the emotions and feelings they were going through. So talk a little bit about that. It was, um, yeah, it was, that, it was one of those days. Um, it's one of those days in your life where uh, it's, it's like, almost like a before and after, and then you, you'll remember, because you remember it, it was so significant. Um, it was, every, and everybody had the same feeling, probably close to the same day, because it was, it was a Thursday, it was March and, and the country shut down the next day. And, you know, I call it, you know, it was like, it was like Black Friday in March, you know, it was like everything shut down. And um, that day in particular, I mean, believe it or not, it's Southern California, it's raining. Like, when does that ever happen? So it was a gloomy day to, to even begin with. Um, but that feeling when, when coach came on the bus and he goes, Hey guys, it's over. Cause we were packed up. We're packed up. We're on a bus and we're going to play in the championship. And he said, it's over. And, um, you know, it, it was a lot of emotion and for different reasons at, at that moment, cause you felt for the kids. I mean, we all worked and I, like the kids put in so much work from August to March as a coaching staff. I mean, that's like a two year process to get there. I mean, you know, you're recruiting kids for two years. You're working out with them for two years. You're taking care of them for, for two years. All these things are doing it just to get to that moment. Um, but there's also a sense of, I mean, I was, I was so grateful just to be there um, too at that moment. And we were very proud of what we did. The, the thing about that day, what makes it different than let's, let's say a cancellation of any other sort is there was so much uncertainty in the world at that moment. Mm. And at that time, you know, I joke, but it was, I didn't know what really what COVID, what, what it was going to be. I, you know, I was, I was having like flashes, like the walking dead. And I'm like, <laughs> it, you know, so I'm like, I don't know what this is. And the hardest part about that day was watching, she was it, 14, 14 young men walk out of that locker room. And you had no idea what was going to happen next in their lives because the school shut down that day. So the school shuts down. They're no longer to come on campus, right? These kids scattered everywhere across Southern California and the country within days. So now like we dictated everything in their lives for nine straight months. What time practice is, what time you go to class, what time you eat lunch, like everything. I mean, we're a part of this, right? And then in a moment, they walk out and it was complete uncertainty and I was scared for them. I, I mean, I was, my, I had anxiety that day, me and coach Mo, our hearts are pounding because we don't know what's going to happen next, like in our own lives, even, but much right. less these kids who are walking like out the door into the unknown. And so it was, that was, a, it was a hard, it was a hard day, but there was so much going on at that moment. Like when I'm driving home, like we, the kids leave and I'm cleaning up because we're told not to come back on campus the next day. So we're fixing all of it. Like I'm, I'm putting a locker room in a state that we're not coming back. We're getting everything ready in the office in a state. So where we can take whatever we need on the go, because we're not allowed to come back on campus. That was a Thursday. They told us Monday morning, it's like a hard line. Like nobody's coming back on campus. So we prepared to leave on that Friday. I wasn't coming back for the weekend. 
So we're preparing to leave East LA like for good. And as I'm doing that, but I'm also on the phone with my wife, who's like a hey, school shut down. She's over, she's a Corona Unified. All right, school shut down there as well. And then we're up there like, well, what supply do I, do I pick up supplies? How much water do I get on the way home? Like things are shutting down. I got all these things going on along with watching my, my man Marquise from Washington, D.C. walk out the door like, where the hell is Marquise going? Right. I'm like, Marquise, do you need a place? You need to come stay with me like now because you can't go back to that apartment by yourself. And I don't know if I can get back down to you because I don't know what's next. And it was it was all kinds of things happening that day. And basketball was a part of it but it wasn't the whole story that day. It was other stories going on as they shut that down, which made that whole day really, really unique. And from a basketball standpoint, I didn't realize the impact, believe it or not, until I watched the show for the first time. Mm. And we got to watch it about two weeks before everybody else. And so they sent us this code, which was scary in itself, that Netflix can send you a code and then operate on your television. (laughs) specifically your television like like i'm watching netflix on my tv downstairs kid you not i come upstairs to do it the same thing and there's a message on there that says no this code is only going to work on that other television i'm like how's netflix talking to me like this like 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 like, it's some real big brother stuff man and it was that was kind of scary that they can dictate netflix can dictate to you one show one show, like they have the power to send that to your Netflix somehow into one device. It's, it's, it's wild. But so we could watch this show. And so I got to watch it and I'm watching it. And I know what's going to happen as it's coming. Cause I was there, but when it happened and we're in that locker room and we're talking all uh, the emotion, it, I was more emotional at that point than I was when it happened. Mm. And I was pretty emotional that day, but it was even more because of what the basketball thing, because I was past the pandemic now. But now I felt for the basketball aspect of it, because those kids gave every, and it's not easy playing right. for us and Coach Mo. Coach Mo's a hard coach to play for. Right. He demands, when I say he's demanding, I mean, I, we lost last night, right? We lost last night. When we got off the bus, we put on practice stuff and went through an hour and a half regular practice that doesn't surprise me then we lifted weights then we went to the track and it was cold and had the had the guy the equipment guy turn on the lights at the track at night to run for turnovers because of the weekend and he did it just to see if anybody would quit Mm. just to see you know and there's no way we're gonna let anybody quit that's impossible once you're with it we're like the mafia you don't get out of east la but that that's hard to play for him. And so these kids went through that, that whole time. And they, they accomplished everything that coach said they could accomplish. And when I said they were ready to go play in that game that day, when they got off the bus, that's an understatement. We were ready. And those kids believed, those kids believed they could beat Gonzaga at that moment. They believed they were never going to lose. It was an incredible feeling. And it all rushed back in that moment. And that was, uh, it was very emotional from a basketball standpoint, rewatching it. When it was live, oh, my gosh, there was so much stuff going on that day that it was my emotions were all over the place for various reasons. Yeah, I think as a, you know, as a coach myself, uh, I kind of when I watched it, I watched it, um, gosh, a while back uh, when it first came out. And I remember watching that last episode when they told you that it's over, you're not going to be playing in the game. I felt the emotion as a coach. Yeah. Not, not as a viewer having sympathy for the coaches and the, and the players on the show. I felt it as a coach, like it had just happened to me. And I was just devastated. Like you put in all this work and all this time, not for yourself, but for your players, for those players. And, and that it really, really hit. I was really devastated. I mean, it really hurt to see that happen, but I'm excited for not only the chance for you guys to get back to it, but the, the fact that you guys are doing season two now and you guys are on a roll and uh, I'm excited to, to see where this, this next next season goes. Oh, it's, it's a heck of a ride. It's, it's a role. It's a different team. They're a talented team, but nobody, we have one guy that returned. So mm, there's only wow. one. Guy. It's a, it's a complete reboot and which junior college is. 
your team is different from Tuesday to Thursday, much less two years in junior college. <laughs> so it's a, uh, it's, it's quite the, it's quite the adventure. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that. And uh, this show, this show has as much stories and drama as, as the first one. Cause like right. I said, we we're a talented group. And if you have a talented group, then bruh, the stories are real What how, why these kids are with us. And so yeah. it's a, uh, it's a, it, it, it's a lot of fun. I'm man. I to, to say that I'm fortunate and blessed to be in this situation is an understatement. You know, um, I didn't even know where I was going to coach after Notre Dame. I had no idea. And, you know, just things happen. And, and, and here I am in like this incredible spotlight and able to, to be a part of such a cool show at a cool level, doing the right thing. Right. Because, Cause as we do this show or as I coach down here, it has nothing to do with me and coach Mo. We already played, like we played before you played before everybody, our, 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 our careers are over. And then from a coaching standpoint, if you're 49 or 50 and you're that worried about your coaching career, something that drastically went wrong in your life, yo, you know, we we're all I'm trying to do is create an experience for other guys that that's, that's it, you know, cause as a player, you know, and as I'm sure you tell your son, like you got four years to create 60 years of memories. That's it. You get four years to create 60 years of memories and you can feel good about that. And so that's what we're trying to give kids is those, that experience to last them a lifetime with the, you know, with the greatest sport ever invented. Yeah. Now I want to ask you one more question and I'll let you go. But I think that, um, you know, as, as a coach, you know, I still coach at the high school level, even though my boys aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I do it because I want to be that role model, kind of that father figure for uh, these players. Now, at where you coach, a lot of these guys come from homes that are that are broken. They mm -hmm. come from homes that they some of them don't, may not even have a home. Right. Yes. And um, right. you have a you have a real important job as not only a coach, but kind of that father figure for them. Um, how has that impacted you as a coach? Because you may have players that come up to you and say, Hey coach, I got to talk to you about something. And it's something on a personal level. And I'm sure it happens. It happens to me at the high school level. So I'm sure it happens to you. So talk about that a little bit. The, um, yeah. Those conversations. Yeah. You have them at the high school level, but they become a whole lot more real and R rated at the college level. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, interesting. It's an interesting dynamic. Uh, but to get to the point, like, uh, for a lot of these kids, like they don't have dads, right. they, like, they don't, they don't have fathers. Um, they don't, I, I would say half of our kids were raised by their mothers and their moms did a good job, but it's still there. They didn't have a dad and, and you don't have that male figure like in your life you have to learn how to deal with that male figure because they never had to do it. And for most of us out in the real world, you're going to have to, you're going to have to deal with that figure again. It's not your coach. It's your boss. You know, right. it's, it's, it's your boss. It's the police. It's uh, you got to deal with authority in, in life. And so teaching that is what coach Mo is incredible at. Uh, coach Mosley is incredible at getting kids right. And they, they'll say like, no, I got we got we got to help you become a man. You know what I'm saying? You you're not you're not one yet. You don't even know how to be one. Well, I'm going to I'm going to teach you how to respond. He's always talking about how you respond to things because that's what a dad will teach you is response. Now, I'm grateful for my dad doing that. My dad wouldn't let me respond any other way than the right way. And I'm grateful for that for 18 years. You know, I couldn't even look out the side of my eye. It would be like, uh, like that's not how you respond. I don't care how much you're mad at me. I don't care how much you're mad at that coach, how much you're mad at that boss. You look them in the eye and be like, all right, and right. you respond correctly. And that's what we do at ELAC. It's coaches teaching response. He don't, if you, he says something to you practice, you look, you, you learn how to respond to adversity. And, and that's what we're teaching these kids at, at, at college. And cause all of them have been successful athletically, like very successful Mm -hmm. So teaching them how to respond to adversity. What do you do when you don't play? What do you do when you don't get the points you're used to getting? You know, what, what do you get when you don't get to play the position you wanted to play? <laughs> like, how are you going to respond to, uh, to that? So a hey, being fatherly, I mean, I was, I was so grateful I got to be one before this. And it's really been a blessing too, is that my kids are almost the same age as these kids as I, as I've learned this level, which mm -hmm. has helped me greatly. 
because I'm not far, far removed from it. You know, if, if my kids were young, then I wouldn't have the opportunity to, to, to coach my own kids in life through 17 to 21, but I have, and I rely on that now with the kids that I coach in junior college. When I'm talking to them, I know what I'm talking about because I got three boys who just went, went through that. And all three of them are different and went through different things. Right. So like, I'm, I'm right there in the mix right now. And so for the next 10 years or 20 years that I'm dealing with, with 18 to 22 year olds, I have a reference point. Like I, I was there, you know? And so I can kind of understand because 10 years ago, I wouldn't have understood. I wouldn't have under uh, fully, you know, not to say you wouldn't have a heart for them, but I get the mistakes that are being, being made. And you, you, you figure out like, I can't judge these kids. My kids had everything that they needed Two loving parents. They had resources. They had a place to stay. They knew their dad was there for them every day and they still made mistakes. Mm. Now I'm dealing with kids who have none of that. Right. So when they make a mistake, I'm like, or even when they do good, I'm like, geez, how'd you even do good out of that situation? You know what I mean? And or when they make a mistake, I'm like, well, shoot, my kids had it better than that. And they still made that same mistake. You know, right. so you have a real heart for them and, and understand. And the biggest thing about teaching these kids at this level or even parenting at this level is I say every day, I just I just wipe the, the whiteboard clean every single day. Nine o'clock at night, I just wipe it off. And then the next day we put some it's, it's all new. I don't care how bad it was or how good it was. I just wipe the slate clean and we'll start over and we'll be great tomorrow no matter what it is, whether it be in my own kids or my JC kids, they will just be great tomorrow. Just wipe it clean. Give them that opportunity to grow every day. That's cool. That's cool. Now. Um, yeah. And I know, you know, you know, obviously uh, the head coach where I coach, uh, coach yeah. Ron, and uh, he talks about it all the time. I'm not here raising you. I'm here to raise good men. Right. Sure. He talks about uh, every single day. I'm here to raise men. And uh, if you have a problem, come talk to me like a man. Yeah. And so, so we preach that at the high school level. So that's, that's good that you're working on that through, through the college level with these kids. But I just want, you know, I've taken way too much of your time. I know. Uh, I no such can't... thing. If we're talking hoops, my man, no <laughs> such thing. No such thing. Yeah. If we're, if we're talking about instruction and curriculum, this would have been over like 20, 30 minutes ago. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm good with that. But if we're talking hoops, Hey dude, I can do that all day. Well, listen, if my, if my listeners wanted to look you up, learn a little bit more about you, uh, what's the best place for them to do all that? Oh man. Um, Hey, when I tell you I'm bad at this social media thing, (laughs) bro. And and you know, it's the worst part too. It's like, you can imagine, like, I mean, I've got followers. No way. I I posted, I think two things on Instagram, maybe. And I think I have like 20,000 followers. I don't even post anything on there. You know, I got like seven, 8,000 people following me on Twitter. I put something up once every six months. And my kids or even the producers at Netflix called me like, yo, Rob, you've got to put something up right now. And I'm like, like what? Like, what am I going to put? That's all going. What am I going to put? I'll put on there like, hey, do some jump stops today. Like, like that's, 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 my, that's my advice, man. Like, you know, so I, let me, I'm going to look it up. What, what my thing is. I can't even remember it offhand because I don't, because I'm, because I'm, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm never on there. And so I don't, and they're lying. They're on there like all the time. Like I, I don't post anything and I know I should, I, you know, I know I should, I need help. I ask my kids every day, like, help me out. Can you put something on there for me? And they say yes. And then they don't do it. So I'm, um, um, for Twitter, I'm at coach two RZ. That's at coach two RZ for uh, Twitter and for Instagram. I don't have a clue what I, what it, what it, I am for, I don't have a clue what I am for Instagram. The other day when I logged on with my kid, he said, he, he goes, he goes, you have like coach, you have, he is the coach. He said, dad, you have like 275 messages. And I'm like, well then forget that. If it was like five, maybe, but 275, that's where it's, that's too much. I'm out. <laughs> like I'm out. I, I don't think I could do that, man. Like I, I, somebody's going to have to do that for me. That, that is for sure. I don't, I don't think I can, I don't think I can make it. Um, dude, I don't even, I'm looking right now. I don't even know how to find my. Oh, here we go. Hold up. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Let me see this. I see a thing that says Coach Rob for my Instagram. Yeah, this doesn't even make any sense. I got all these followers. I can't even find out what my Instagram is. <laughs> oh, I see that part. Yeah. Oh, oh wait, wait. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Coach Rob underscore Elac. All right. Yeah, that's me. I'm Coach Rob underscore Elac. Uh, you can catch you can catch there. Twitter, I probably I respond to probably something like on that. Um, Instagram's overwhelming to me. And then I don't know if you know anything about if you use Instagram or anything like that, but it's not something I was really into. It became really popular like in the last couple of years. Um, but I kid you not, since I've been in college, there's been about three occasions where one of my players are like, he said, Hey coach, look at this on Instagram. And believe me, I wish I didn't look at it when he showed <laughs> his phone. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, check this out. And I'm looking, I'm like, Oh, Hey, oh man i'm like like am i going to jail for looking at am i in trouble should i i don't should, i shouldn't have looked at that right like why are you like what the heck so now whenever it says instagram i'm like I don't know, i'm good man like i don't see anything positive I, I see nothing positive happening with that right there so i, I don't even check it out but but i hit that on twitter i email me to college like at any time and anybody like if you if you was to hit me up on uh, on our hoops email at, on our website anybody listening and yourself and your team hey hit me up and come to a game vip i'll let everybody in get to see the players come by the locker room like i everyone should get this feel and be a part of of that level and see it you know it's it's an incredible thing to be a part of yeah well awesome um yeah i'm gonna be coming to one of your games i gotta come check one out so um, I'm going to be looking up your guys' schedule. I'll Come on you know. down, man. We'll have a, we'll have a great time and bring guys, man, like bring them. Cause they'll, I'll tell, uh, I'll tell Ron. They'll all bring and Ron and all of them because everybody says like, Hey, I want to play in college. And then they come like high school kids. They come and watch our warm up, and then they go, well, never mind. Right. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's not going <laughs> to, that, that's not going to happen when you, when you see our 13th guy, you know, who's, who's seven, who's seven foot with like five division one offers, you're like, well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, especially yeah. because of COVID because everybody is old and playing and all the ages are messed up. Now you got 21 year old freshmen and it's like, you know, like 17, 18 year old kids don't even have a chance. It's so hard now. And so it's good that they see if a 15, 16 year old kid sees right now what he's up against. Because yeah, now okay. you're not delusional. You're like, okay, I got to be that just to play here. And we're not even talking about the Pac-12, the Mountain West, the Big West. Just to be here, this is what you got to be? Yeah, maybe I should start listening to Coach Ron a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe I should start listening to Coach a little bit more. Yeah. I know with, uh, with, with my younger son, uh, he plays at Hope International University. And I know, I mean, even on game days. On game days, uh, I you can't I can't text him. He he can't text back because he's busy. Their game may not be till the evening, but they've got team lunch together. Then they do a walkthrough. I mean, he's got all this stuff going on for the day. Twelve hour process. And then and then practices. I mean, sometimes his practices are at nine o'clock at night, and they'll do they'll do a run through a practice, and they'll go to the weight room. And I'm like, dude, what time are you going to bed? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, it's, dude. oh, it's it. You know what? It's crazy, but it's the best time of his life. Yeah, he's loving it. It's the it. absolute best time. And it's so hard in it because you're broke. You know what I mean? You remember when you're poor and you're living in poverty, but you get to play hoops and you're like, and you're like, man, I, it's got to be better one day. And then you look back and be like, no, nope, that, that was it. That was the best. That was, <laughs> that was the best it ever was when I had when I had ramen and nothing else to do. That was the right. best time of my life. You know what I mean? But and now I got this big, now I got this big old house with four rooms full of everything. And I'm like, what the heck? I missed, <laughs> I missed the apartment with four other dudes and no money. Like what, what the heck? Awesome. Well, uh, listen, coach, I appreciate you uh, joining me today. I oh, love it. Um, love it. Brian. I really do appreciate it. It's good to see you again and I'm um, looking forward to it. Let me just uh, let all my fans know. Hey guys, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for checking out this episode. Uh, make sure you check out coach Rob, make sure you check out what they're doing at, uh, at ELAC and um, they're just, they're on a roll. Um, so make sure you guys check them out maybe catch a game if you're in the local area. Uh, but I just want to thank my good friend, Rob, for uh, being on the show, brother. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Dad Up Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next weekly episode. While you're at it, leave a rating and review. And if you know someone this show can help, be sure to share it with them. Want to learn more? Check out the website at daduptribe.com or leave Brian a message on Instagram at daduppodcast.